A scribe of the Torah will ritually bathe before he writes a word on the sacred parchments. No base metals may be involved in the creation of any part of the Torah, so the scissors that the scribe uses to cut the vellum that he writes on is made from gold. All animal products that are used in the production of the Torah must come from animals who could be kosher if they were killed in the right manner. As long as you are not writing the name of God, if you make a mistake, you may scrape the letter off and rewrite it. But if you are writing the name of God, you must sing each letter as you write it. And if you make a mistake in writing the name of God, the entire parchment is destroyed and you must restart that section of the Torah. This is how seriously Jewish scribes take the creation of the written word of their religion. Even in this day and age, it is a ritual and a tradition passed down from the days of Judea. And writing is the topic of my conversation today. I would like to talk to you about what writing offers you from a fantasy world-building perspective. The rituals you can make that go along with it, the writing implements you can use, and what it offers you both magically and from building the history of your world. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please do hit the subscribe button. And let's get cracking. First, let's talk about writing implements. How do you physically write? The Sumerians wrote on clay tablets using a stylus as a show and now. Those clay tablets had to be baked in order to preserve them. So it was quite a cumbersome process of writing on the clay tablets and then baking them to preserve them unless you didn't need to preserve them. The Egyptians wrote on papyrus using reed pens. Now these reed pens were cut from literal reeds and they were dipped in ink and then written on the papyrus. The problem with reed pens is they didn't last very long because they would get soft and soggy in ink and break and so on. This led to changing from reed pens to quills, which is made from the feathers of birds. All kinds of birds were used from geese feathers to peacock feathers to ostrich feathers, if you're feeling very swanky. Now, I did say that the Egyptians wrote with ink. So what is ink? Ink is a carrier or vessel with a pigmentation. Today, the carrier used is predominantly vegetable oil. But back when ink was invented, it was quite often that it was an animal fat used as the carrier. The first pigmentation was soot, which is why ink was characteristically black. But you can, of course, use other pigmentation. And in this day and age, we have a rainbow of colors to choose from in our inks. Ink was saved in dry cakes, which was then mixed with water in order to provide the liquid ink that is used. So much for the Egyptians' quills and inks. The Romans wrote on wax tablets using a stylus, kind of reminiscent of the Sumerians and their clay tablets, except that the Roman tablets could be wiped and reused, which was obviously very handy. Wax tablets, however, does have the downside that it can't take heat very well. So if you're in a very hot climate, a wax tablet certainly won't preserve your writing for very long. In Catherine Kerr's world, in the very poor castles of Devery, the scribes would often write on wax tablets similar to the Romans in order to save on the cost of inks and paper and pens, which could be very expensive. So wax tablets can be used to reduce your cost of writing for things that aren't important to preserve over the long term, something like recording who has brought in their taxes regularly or something like that, you could record on wax rather than going to the expense of paper and ink. In China, 
they developed writing with a brush. So instead of writing as we do here in the West with a pen, the Chinese engaged in art form as writing. So you would write, but you would also with a brush paint a picture. And this resulted in an ink-based art form that is absolutely beautiful and persists to this day in the form of the Far Eastern calligraphy. In Venice, in the 1700s, they invented the glass pen, which is a beautiful implement where you take the pen and you dip it into the ink and it has these ridges on it. And into those ridges rolls the ink and then you use the pen to write with almost like a brush, but with a fine nub point of a pen rather than the more broad strokes of a brush. This is the writing implement that I chose for my continent of Kisangi. The reason why I chose to have the continent of Kisangi write with glass pens is because on Kisangi, in a city called Fariweb, there is a powerful guild of glass blowers. So when they figured out that they could make a writing instrument which could be sold to the temples and to the merchants and to basically the whole continent, anybody who wanted to write, they made it their mission to make this glass pen as accessible as possible. And so Kisangi uses a glass pen. Back to our world, the mass production of the steel nib changed pen making. It went from quills to the fountain pen at this point. And the reason for that is mass production reduced the price of the pen point to enable normal people to afford them. And of course, the fountain pen eventually led to the ballpoint pen, mostly due to the space race. Speaking of the space race, there is that horrible urban legend of the Russians going to space with a pencil and the Americans spending millions of dollars inventing the ballpoint pen to go to space with. Actually, both of them were trying to invent a pen to go to space with, and both of them used pencils before that. So, you know, while the joke is funny, it's not actually valid. But that does bring me to pencils. A pencil is basically graphite wrapped in a holder. When graphite was first discovered, they actually wrapped leather around the graphite in order to write with it. It is our modern pencils that have the wooden handle of a pencil. The advantage that a pencil gives you, besides working in space, theoretically, is that, <laughs> is that it can be erased. And in today's day and age, of course, many pencils come with an eraser on their back. This means that you can remove mistakes, and it also means that you can reuse potentially expensive paper. And of course, then we come to typewriters, word processors, computers, and the dictaphone. In one of Isaac Asimov's foundation book, there is a whole chapter written about a girl and her new dictaphone. She wanted a dictaphone that basically automatically puts in punctuation. And her guardian didn't want her to have such a dictaphone. He wanted her to have a dictaphone that would force her to still understand and implement grammar rules and wasn't as intuitive as what she wanted. What is interesting to me about Asimov's use of the dictaphone in that context is that it hearkens to how our parents tend to think. It didn't really matter what level her dictaphone was at, but her guardian wanted her to do it as he had done it. It's a sort of enforcement of the tradition because writing and the way that we write has become steeped in lore and tradition. But why is that? It is because writing is in and of itself a kind of magic. Not like runic magic. That, of course, is a whole thing by itself, and I did make a video about it. Writing is magic in that it is the communication of people from the past speaking to us in the present. And that is a powerful thing. 
The oldest written name that we know of is from the Kushim tablet. It was found in the Uruk period, and it reads 29,086 measures of barley, 37 months, Kushim. We don't know what exactly that means. Maybe it was taxes that Kushim was paying. Maybe it was that amount of barley that he was storing at the temple for 37 months. And what has survived to us is his bank deposit slip. Wouldn't that be amazing? We know his name. He lived so long ago, it makes my teeth ache to think on it. And we know his name. The oldest surviving love poem was written in the 21st century BC. It is written in Sumerian, in cuneiform. It was discovered in Nippur, and it was dated to 2031 BC. It is called Istanbul 2461 by archaeologists who clearly have no imagination. It's written on a clay tablet, and it was believed to have been written by the bride of the Sumerian king, Shu Shin, who reigned between 2037 BC and 2029 BC. And it reads as follows. Bridegroom, dear to my heart, goodly is your beauty, honey sweet, lion, dear to my heart, goodly is your beauty, honey sweet. I don't know how I'd feel about receiving that kind of poem today, but that it survived to us, that somebody wrote those words on that tablet is incredible to think about. So all that is left behind in our history is what people wrote down. Therefore, it stands to re reason that all that would be left behind in your world is fragments of things that people wrote behind. Texts like how much barley they deposited in their bank. Texts like this love poem. We don't know how important those things were to them, but it is what survived. That brings up a great thing about including ancient writings in your world. That poem that I just read, that is our translation based on other things that we have found. Nobody speaks ancient Sumerian at this point in time. We speak what we think to be ancient Sumerian. Who knows how accurate that translation is? And that makes for glorious misunderstanding and fantastic fantastic plot points in any given story at any time. So the written word allows you to have a conflicted past where people can discover things, translate them, retranslate them, discover new things, and thus build a layered and measured world. And not only that, but those mistranslations can become a core point in your plots. It is, in fact, what I did with my prophecies called the fragmented visions. They were written millennia ago in a language no one speaks anymore. And now they're translated differently by different people. And thus the interpretation of them is even more open than a normal prophecy because they could literally have been mistranslated. So that is one of the kinds of magic of writing that is present even in our world, the magic of the past speaking to us. But there is also literal magic. We are, after all, fantasy world builders. The manga Death Note uses writing in a very interesting way. So this Japanese teenager, Light Yagami, discovers a mysterious notebook, and when he writes somebody's name in it, he gains the supernatural ability to kill them. So the written word in this case is one of those, by writing it, you make it true, which is also in our world a way of saying the history is written by the victors. What is written down is what is true, never mind what was actually true at the time. Remember, we remember what is written down. But anyway, this is a much more supernatural effect. By writing it down, you make their death true. Brandon Sanderson has a particularly interesting magic around writing in the Stormlight archives. In the Stormlight archives, he has these implements called span reads. Now, they are fabriles. They are paired fabriles. So you take a ruby, you split it in two, you attach it to a pen. 
those two rubies remain paired. So when this pen writes, this pen also writes independently. And so you can communicate between two people using these pens. And that is called span reads, which is a fascinating magic because it uses writing, but it uses writing and sympathetic magic. So you've got twinned objects and that allows you to communicate like a fax machine. And then, of course, in Doctor Who, you have that piece of paper that can be whatever the doctor wants it to be, that blank piece of paper that can be his identification. And that's another form of what is written is true. So you can see that what is written is true pulling through quite often in writing magics. And now I do want to call back to my opening when I spoke about writing the Torah. Religion and writing go hand in hand, in my opinion. Why? Because religions that write things down are religions that last. When I did my video on taboo development, I also referenced the Jewish writing because when the Judean kingdom wrote down that pigs are forbidden, then pigs became forbidden. I leveraged this in my world in my religion of the order of the threesome, and yes, the joke is intended. Now, this religion does have an artifact called the digao, the pen of knowing, and their religious laws are written down on quartz sheets that are kept in the great temple in Magadla in the holy city. Now, if the exalted meet and they determine that the words of the gods, the truth of the gods, had been incorrectly interpreted by men and that the law must change, therefore. They have a ritual they go through. They will go down to where the quartz tablets are kept. The leader of the priests of the left-hand god will destroy the old tablet in its entirety with a sledgehammer. The leader of the priests of the right-hand god, the first husband of the right hand, will prepare the new quartz tablet by smoothing it out with some special gemstone-covered gloves. And then the balancer, the chief priestess of the goddess, will write the new law onto the quartz tablet using the digao, the diamond pen of knowing. What I leverage there is what is written is what is true. Because whatever the law was before is gone, destroyed by the left-handed God. And what is there now has always been the law as interpreted by the exalted. And that is my thoughts on what writing, writing implements and the use of writing in your world can offer you as a world builder and from a plot perspective. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Just In Time Worlds. Please do hit the thumbs up button, remember to subscribe, and I will see you soon for another episode.